Now, the word grace, uh, it, 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 it simply means a gift. It's charis. And uh, it simply means that you would, you would give another person a gift. You say, uh, I want to give you a gift. And in the Greek, you would have said, uh, I want to give you charis. I want to show something to you. But that idea of gift, it's not just a regular gift. It's a very special, a very pleasing, a very beneficial gift that you give to another person. And in the Bible... The word grace is particularly about the idea that you get given a gift that you did not deserve, okay? Sometimes we get given gifts in life, and uh, we we kind of have an expectancy that we're going to get them. Like at a birthday, you turn to your neighbor, your, your spouse and say, where's my gift? But there is times in life where we get given gifts that um, we, we didn't deserve them. And that's really what grace is about. When actually maybe you should have not only had a gift withheld, but you should have actually got um, a rebuke or or a punishment or something like that. Uh, But instead, the person in grace gives you something, a blessing, a favor, a privilege, something awesome in your life. But you know, I did not deserve that. That was actually extra. I was reading an amazing story about a couple of guys down in the States. I'm going to go with the name William and Bill, although Bill is is a shortage of William, isn't it? So we're going to go with William and Bill. But William and Bill, they are two guys in a church. One is a seasoned believer, William, and Bill is a, this is a true story, by the way. Bill is a guy who is um, a young believer, and Bill is wanting to grow in Jesus Christ, and Bill has a problem with swearing, cursing, foul language. And because he came from, from a, a difficult background, he just, it flies. His language just flies. So William and Bill said, we really want to help you overcome the problem you have with bad language. And so what they decided to do is William and Bill agree, Bill, during the week, I want you to count up every time you curse. And then we're going to charge you a buck for every time you curse. We're going to charge you a loony every time you curse. And at the end of the week when we meet... You're going to tally up how much money you owe, and we're going to put that money into the offering. We're thinking about instigating this in the church as well. We think this is a good system right here. We like this idea. And so uh, they, off they go. And the first week, the, the, the thing ends, and Bill tallies up, and it's like 120 bucks. He has a problem, right? And uh, so they do that. And the next week, he comes back, and it's like $80, $90 again. The third week he comes back, it's another $100. It's not working very well. It's another 100 bucks that he owes on his cursing. And this time, Bill says, and, and, and William can see that Bill is really struggling because now it's actually getting quite expensive. So what William says the next week he comes, and he says, he comes, William says, wait a minute, before you pay the money, fourth week, before the money, this is what I want to do. I'm going to give you a check. I'm writing a check to the church from my account on your behalf. And I'm writing six of them. And I'm leaving the amount blank. Every time you curse, you still keep a record of your cursing. Tell me how much we owe, but I will pay the bill for you. Isn't that beautiful? And he did that, true story, and that actually changed the guy because he he was not now just paying for it himself, somebody was paying for it for him who had no reason why they should be paying it. That's grace. It is when you get a gift for something where you yourself actually don't deserve it, but somebody has still given it, even when you did not and should not have had anything to do with it. And what we discover in the Christian life is that this principle of receiving God's favor, even when we did not merit it, in fact, we should have got the opposite, is it is prevalent in, in the Christian life. From beginning to end, we live this life by the grace of Jesus Christ. There's so many ways and so many uh, situations where we should receive something far different, even as Christians. But God in His grace has gone ahead and enabled it to work in our lives. Now, I was thinking about that hymn. Everybody knows that hymn. It's the most famous hymn in the world. I see non-Christians singing it in movies, having no idea what that song is about, but people just love the song, the hymn, Amazing Grace. 
It has got to be the most classic, greatest hymn of all time. And I went over it again, and I thought, wow, John Newton, who was the writer of it, um, he, God really, the Holy Spirit was on him when he wrote that hymn. Because each stanza of the hymn actually illuminates a different way grace works in our lives. So I thought, well, let's just go through the hymn real quick this morning, just to highlight again the extent that we have received grace in our lives as Christians. The first stanza is about saving grace. The grace that we had that helped us and enabled us to even receive Jesus Christ. This is what he says in the first stanza. You don't have to sing it. We'll just speak it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Here, John Newton, the writer, is speaking about the fact that it was grace that saved him. It was grace, the unmerited favor of God, when God should have rejected him, ignored him, destroyed him. It was the grace of God that reached out to John Newton as a sinner and brought him into the kingdom of God, worked in his life, changed his life. When John Newton looked over his life, if you know the story of John Newton, he was a slave trader. He was a very wicked man. He was so wicked that even the other slave traders did not like to be around him. One time they got so fed up with John Newton that they actually took him to an island and made him a slave of the slaves on the island. That's how much they hated him. He was a really obnoxious guy. And he reflects on his life and says, Ah, oh, look at what I was. How could it be? that I am no God and my life has been turned around. He reflects back about how wicked he was. And if you know the story of his conversion, it was over time, but it happened twice that he was on a ship sailing in the slave trade. They hit an incredibly terrible storm. He feared that his life was going to be lost. He got the scriptures. He found the scriptures on the boat. He found tracts and, and, and literature on the boat to read about the saving power of Jesus Christ. And as he read them and he read the literature, he called upon the name of the Lord. And as he reflects on his life, he says, I am saved by the grace of God. I should never, God should never have done anything to reach out towards me. God should never have worked to reach towards me. I should have been destroyed. But God's grace is that he gives gifts to those who don't even merit it. And he says, I see the way that the Holy Spirit has worked in my life. That storm was an act of God's grace to shake me to my boots, that my heart would become open to receiving the gospel. That literature, the word of the Lord, are acts of grace. The word which brings the gospel of truth that sets me free. The literature that was there to help explain and, and show me the way to go forward. He says, I, when I look back at my life and this, this hymn, he's saying, I see that it was grace that opened my eyes. It was grace that worked on me and prepared my heart to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9, Paul reiterates this theme. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not because of works, lest anyone should boast. We are all saved by grace. God worked in our lives. He called us. He, he prepared our hearts. He, 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 and he's doing that. Even if you do not know Jesus Christ today, the same grace is also upon you. The same grace is also upon you. And if you would open your heart and receive that what is happening in your life is a work of God to draw you to him, you can be drawn to him and receive saving grace, just as this vile man received saving grace and his life was turned around. Second stanza is about the grace in which we abide, abiding grace, the grace which we live daily in Christian life. It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. What beautiful words. And as you think about this second stanza, he's talking about after having received saving grace, now as he walks in life, this grace that covers him, that now he's aware of it. He's now aware that 
things that are happening in his life, he doesn't deserve them. He ends up getting married. I never deserved to get married. I was a vile uh, guy who just slept around, but God in his grace, I am married. He becomes a vicar. God in his grace is using me. He becomes an abolitionist. God in his grace has changed my heart. See, so as I've lived my Christian walk, and I'm aware so much of how God's grace works, even when I don't deserve it. When he looks and he says, this grace has changed me. This grace has taught my heart to fear. This grace has helped my fears become relieved. Praise God for that. And that story we heard earlier, I like that story about uh, how this man, when he received grace, it helped change him. I, I heard a story many, many years ago. Uh, I don't know whether it's true or not, but it, it's a great story. Uh, I just love the story. I've shared it sometimes maybe many years ago, but I just love the story about a village in the Hawaiian Islands, and um, the, the, there was this man who had a son, and the son was very wealthy. He was very successful. Even at a young age, he was very successful. He had become wealthy quite quickly, he just seemed to have a knack for business, but he wasn't married. And uh, they were trying to work out who, who he'd marry, and um, there was a young woman in the village who uh, uh, kind of was shy and, 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 and receding and... Uh, um, kind of her posture wasn't the best, and you kind of couldn't tell who she was. She was kind of like withdrawn. Anyhow, they all thought this young man would marry one of the beauties of the village, but he went to the uncle or the father of, of, of this girl because in their tradition they paid bride price, dowry, and he went to her, uh, to the father, and, and he sat down with him. And uh, traditionally in the village, if, if you were paying a lot for a bride, you felt like the bride, and I know this is in our modern culture is terrible, but this is the way it's done in other places. Uh, you know, you might offer a dowry of one, a two or three cows as kind of just a, as a sign of respect. And so when this young man met with the father, the father felt like he might get, because the young man's wealthy, maybe he will honor us with two cows. And they started the negotiations and the young man just said, I, I don't really want to negotiate. I'm going to offer you 10 cows for your daughter. And everybody, felt, no one had ever heard of this before. This was an absolutely an astro astronomical sum of money. And so the young man, they agreed, off, obviously, and the young man got married. And then he moved. He left the village and took his wife with him, and they went and lived in another place. And, 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 and many years later, the uncle went to visit of the girl. And when he visited, he was uh, amazed when he met his, his niece, how much she had transformed, how she had, uh, posture had changed, her demure had changed, her confidence had changed, her, her, her beauty had changed, her poise had changed. And the uncle said, well, you know, it's, it's amazing. And the young man said, yeah, this is, this is why I paid I honored her with such a high dowry. I wanted her to know how much she was worth. I wanted her to understand how much she means to me, how valuable she was to me. And, and in the Christian life, the reason God keeps pouring grace upon us, as he says in his, his, his hymn, he says, it's grace that has taught my heart to fear. When he says fear here, he's not talking about a, a, a negative fear. He's talking about it is grace that has taught my heart to love God. And it is grace that has removed the deep-rooted fear that is in every single person's heart. I have, I have, as I've, I've seen, the, the scriptures say, Paul says in Romans, he says, listen, God has poured his grace out to draw you to himself. Don't, don't mistake the blessings in your lives and don't take them as something to build an obstinance or a, a resistance, but see the blessings that God has poured you as a way to show you how much God loves you, that you would move from a position of being fearful. And we, we are a people who are fearful in so much that we do in our lives. We are fearful about so much. But grace is what John is saying, has changed me. It's changed me from a person who's driven by fear to a person who resides and is stationed and is standing in the grace of Jesus Christ. Confident that God has done this for me. Through many dangers, moving on to the third, and toils and snares I have already come, was grace that brought me safe this far, and grace will lead me home. This is the grace that speaks of our, about the act of grace. 
We abide in grace as Christians. We live in grace. And we have been, the word is revealing more and more how much God loves us, which gives us confidence as we live, confidence in our prayer, confidence in what we do. But then there are times where we need acts of grace. Times when we, we need just a special gift for that moment, for that time, for that situation. And I find in my life, I sometimes need those special gifts two or three times a day. Anybody like that with me? Just, I need a gift to help me handle the kids this morning, Lord. I need a gift this morning to handle my husband, Lord. I need a gift today to handle my boss, to handle the traffic, to handle whatever it is, the sickness or the tiredness or the the lowness that I'm feeling. Lord, I need your grace in a special way today. And we serve a God who grace means we don't deserve it, but he does it anyhow. We serve a God who pours out grace. And he says, listen, I've gone through many dangers, many toils, many sneers. But grace has brought me safe this far. God's unabounding, undeserved favor has been poured out in situations where I could have ended, but God has come and intervened, and he's done an amazing work. John Newton talked about how he'd gone through shipwrecks, through enslavement. He had a stroke later in his life. But in every stage of the way, God's grace was poured out in a fresh measure, in a special way. I love what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, That's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Uh, for a number of reasons, but he says in verse 8, three times I pray for the Lord for the, about this, and it should leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in your weakness. I will all the more gladly boast in my weakness, for the power of Christ may rest upon me. I, I just love this passage because it speaks to two sides of the equation. Paul prayed, he had a, we think it's a sickness, we're not sure, but he prayed three times. I love that. It means that Paul walked in grace, and he, he had this confidence when he prayed with an expectancy God would work. He, he, he prayed, he, and he content, didn't ask once, but he asked three times, God, heal me. He had this idea that he had knowledge that he was favored of God, not by anything he had done, but what, what God had done through and through Jesus Christ. And therefore, he could pray boldly for every need, believing God would pour out an act of grace in his life. And I want to encourage every believer here, I always fight against this theology that you shouldn't do this. That, that's a, I don't think that's a right way to understand grace. Grace gives us the boldness. We are loved of God to ask God for these things that we need in life. Yet at the same time, when he did not receive it, he still received something. He received a deposit of grace that enabled him to handle the sickness. He received a, a mercy, a, 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 a sense of God's being with him that says, okay, I haven't got the miracle, but I have been given strength to keep going. I have been given the ability to keep going. God's grace. And we need these acts of grace in our life. And some of us, we find we need them daily, hourly to keep going. God, pour your grace out upon me. Some would say, well, isn't that a bit, isn't that a bit, like, can't you stand on your own two feet? I cannot stand on my own two feet. I'm just telling you the truth. I cannot stand on my own two feet. I stand on the grace of Jesus Christ, working in my life, helping me, calling upon him daily and hourly that he would change me and help me and get me to where I need to go. And so this series is about this idea of grace. And in particular, it's about the means of grace, the means of grace. It's an old theological term, but it basically just means the way that we can access grace even more. What provisions have we been given to lay hold of grace in times of need? Because we always have times of need, and and God wants to work grace into us through and through and have this confidence that there are ways which we can access God, and, 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 and that grace is not just random. Grace is not just something that God gives, but God loves it when we seek Him. He will pour out His grace even in extra measure. And so I just that's just what this series is about. How do we access grace? What are some of the means that Scripture tell us that we can have more grace in our lives? One of the most obvious ways is through the Word of God, through Scripture. Some people, when you see them come into salvation, you'll see some people who, as Landry, did you notice what Landry said about one of the youth? He said, they just got it. So a young person is hearing the gospel, hearing the message, and something just goes, Bing! and they understand what it means about Jesus dying for them. And they have that faith to lay hold of that and believe that. And when they do, they're transformed. And you're, wow, they just got a special gift to be able to believe. 
because I've got people in my family or I've got friends or I've got somebody I love or somebody around me and I've brought them and they've heard the gospel and they're kind of like looking in the dark with squinty eyes and they just can't quite see it. And they say, I kind of see what you're talking about, but I don't really get it. And not enough for them to lay hold of the promise and be transformed. And one would say to self, well, then it's God who chooses one to receive and God who chooses another not to receive. But I don't believe that to be true. I believe the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And when people sit under the word of the Lord, this word has the power to soften hearts and bring grace into people's lives. God gave this word. This is what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, verse 12 to 13, with passage we were looking at before. For it was revealed, that's to the prophets, they were not serving themselves but you in the things which now have been announced, pronounced, or written down for you by those who preach the good news through the Holy Spirit. So through the preaching and sitting under the Word of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things which even angels struggle to understand. Look at that. The mysteries of the gospel, even angels struggle to understand them. Therefore, gird up your minds, be sober, set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When we see Christ clearly, that's when we receive the grace. What Peter is saying here is that the word, the prophets, and the saints have preached the word of God through this scripture. And as we spend time in this scripture, we receive revelation of Jesus Christ. And when we receive revelation of Jesus Christ, we receive grace. We receive grace like we've never seen it before. Have you ever been sitting in a a sermon and God just opened your eyes? That's the grace of Jesus Christ. Have you ever been reading a book and you go, whoa, that's the grace of Jesus Christ. Have you ever been listening to Recalibrate Podcast? Just kidding with you. And going, wow, that's amazing. That's the grace of Jesus Christ. We as believers, why we love the Word of God, why we go into the Word of God. I just got this little app this week that I'm testing out. So don't ask me about it because I'm still in the testing stage to give it pastor's approval. But it's a little discipleship app that sends you a couple of scriptures a day with questions. And I've noticed just twice a day, stopping, reading the word of the Lord and thinking about it, God moves in my life. Come on now, right? Just like that. We wonder how we get grace. This is an avenue of grace in our lives. We, we, we're not living under this thing where God may move or not move. No, let us boldly enter and receive the grace of God by reading the Scriptures, letting the Scriptures speak to us, by pursuing the Scriptures. Why do we push the Scripture? Because as we go into the Scripture, it releases the grace of God in your life. It opens your eyes. May not immediately, may not all the time, but it releases the grace of God. And the word of the Lord is is powerful for changing us. And if you need more grace, grace in times of need, to understand the depth of grace in your life, to get rid of the fear and insecurities in your life and the the bondages, let the word of God be the the vehicle of grace that brings it into you. Obviously, another one is prayer. That's an easy one. Hebrews 4 verse 16 says, Let us with confidence draw near the throne of grace, for you will have mercy and find grace in time of need. There's no better scripture. Nothing else needs to be said. Seek God. You will find grace. You will find mercy in times of need. Hallelujah. It's the last one that I want to talk about uh, in terms of just prepping us for the series that we're about to go in. We have the word that helps us receive grace. We have prayer that helps us access grace. But we also have community, which helps us access grace. And that's what this series is about, specifically about those rights such as communion we did this morning, that are places and points where we come in community and by focusing on Jesus Christ in those moments, grace flows. How many of you felt the Holy Spirit this morning? That is the grace of Jesus Christ. That is the grace. You have been graced this morning with God's presence. We've got to be thankful for that, right? There's people out there who have never experienced the presence of God. You experienced it in worship, in the Lord's table, in so many ways this morning. And so this series is to look at some of these practices that we will be doing, that we do in the Christian life. I'm talking about for this series, we're going to be looking at the Lord's table. We're going to be looking at baptism and water. We're going to be looking at the lean on of hands for healing. We're going to be looking at corporate prayer and worship, the corporate worship. We're going to be looking at the lean on of hands for the fresh measure of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be looking at the instilling of God. We're going to look at just a number of things that Jesus told us to do in community that when we do them, they release fresh measures of grace in our lives. Um, 
Some of these Jesus specifically told us, particularly the Lord's table and baptism. And some of these, uh, he indicated them, and then they were amplified by the apostles later in the scripture. I want to mention just briefly that sometimes these things are called ordinances. And sometimes they are even called sacraments. And I just want to lay, we'll get into this more as we go. And, and particularly, we are doing teachings on the podcast. So we're, uh, the new season has started on our Recalibrate podcast. Do we have the, uh, the sign for that? So starting Monday morning, the first one is going out. And this will go into deeper teaching on some of these issues and reflection on some of these issues about these things that we'll be talking about to kind of really make sure we immerse ourselves in the series and really learn from the Lord. We encourage you, you can pick up our podcast on, I think, all major podcast providers. iTunes seems to be very, very popular the most, and then there's others out there. You can pick it up there. But I just want to talk for a second just about ordinances, sacraments, and what we're talking about here. These things that are given to us, communion, baptism, so on and so forth. In the Old Testament of the Bible, there's a story about one time the people of Israel were grumbling and complaining where they were in the wilderness. And they started to die. God sent snakes and people started to die from poison. Moses interceded on the people's behalf and God said, make an image of a snake, a bronze snake, and put it on a stick. And when people look at that bronze snake, if they've been poisoned, they will be healed. Crazy story. Uh, about 100, 700, 800 years later, and not quite that much, three, 400 years later, that snake on the stick, people now were worshipping it. They thought that the healing power came from the actual physical object. They wanted to touch it to receive their healing. And God was so unhappy with that because there is no image before God, only God, that he made them break, the, break it up and, and, and crush it and get rid of the dust so that nobody could turn something that was a symbol into the source. And so just theologically as we go into the series to make sure everybody understands where we're coming from, if you do not understand what I'm saying, God bless you, it's all right, you will listen to Recalibrate and you're going to get it all sorted out. But as a church, as we talk about the ordinances, we're talking about these places like the Lord's Table where we get to remember and focus in in community and then Jesus is in there and the presence in the room and as we, as we think about him and think about what he's done for us, his presence and that is the grace being revealed in our midst. We are not a church that believes the sacraments or the ordinances in of themselves are vehicles of grace. And we'll explain that more and encourage you if you're going, what the heck is that guy talking about? Go on to recalibrate and we'll talk more about that in the coming days. God has given in the community uh, as, a, as, a, as a source to you and a source to me to see grace flow in our lives more freely. We, my wife and I love watching The Crown. And I'm sure we're going to wait till we get up to the latest drama that just happened in the last few days uh, with the royal family. But there was one story in The Crown a few, a few seasons ago where Prince Philip, when he, was, he went to a boarding school when he was a boy. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, the, the husband of the queen, when he was a young boy, he went to a boarding school in Scotland. And he heard news that his sister had died. He loved her. She died in a plane crash. And he was a very independent, stubborn young man. And he went out and he decided he was going to build the gates to the school by himself. And he stayed out there for hours and hours and hours, got cold, bruised, beaten, trying to make this thing happen. And all the students wanted to help him, but the headmaster said, do not go and help him. You, he has not asked for help, and he's a little bit proud. We're going to leave him to it. He got so broken, eventually he came in and just said, I need help. And the headmaster said, everybody go and help. And they all went and helped. Why do I tell that story? We have access to grace through the word of God. We have access to grace through prayer. And what I think God wants us to reveal in this coming season is that we have access to grace through community. God has given us many wonderful things that we can do where grace can be revealed. Laying hands on each other 
praying for each other, all different kinds of things. You, we do not have to live this Christian life struggling. I believe every person can live the Christian life victoriously. But it can't do it by yourself. You need community around you. And the, and the tools that community has been got, given to help build your faith, to help strengthen you, to help you run like never before.